The sound of a helicopter circling was the first sign that something horrendous had happened. It was just before quarter past three on a chilly Saturday afternoon in February when a dog walker made a horrifying discovery. The body of a young girl lay lifeless, covered in blood near some steps and a bench in Colchester Linear Park. Police emergency. Police and ambulance. I'm on Colchester Linear Park and someone's been attacked. We've seen the attackers run away and she's on. Well, I think they're the attackers. They've run away from the body, she's very hurt and we need the ambulance and police and we probably need to send the air ambulance because of where she is. Within minutes of the frantic 999 call, the area was swarmed with emergency services. Desperate attempts were made to save the teenager, but she was tragically pronounced dead at the scene. Initial examinations by detectives revealed that the girl had been repeatedly stabbed. The victim was 16-year-old Brianna Jai. A teenager who dared to be different. The forming of a deadly friendship, finally, the full story of Brianna Jai's murder can be told. After restrictions preventing her killer's identities from being published were lifted as they were sentenced for their wicked crime. Manchester Crown Court has been the scene of some of the most horrific murder trials in recent history. These include the nurse Lucy Letby and the gangster who killed nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Bell. But this case was different. Prosecutors described it as one of the most disturbing cases they'd ever dealt with while the judge described the killing as exceptionally brutal and sadistic. Looking back on the case, I'd say it's one of the most harrowing cases I've covered as a court reporter. You hear a lot of grim details in my line of work, but this was amongst the most serious and grave crimes that I've ever covered, and I think it'll stay with me for a long time. Brianna was lured to her death by Scarlett Jenkinson, a then 15-year-old schoolgirl who was fueled by an obsession with serial killers and an obsession with Brianna. After her arrest, police discovered handwritten notes in her bedroom detailing the crimes of murderers like Jeffrey Dahmer, Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, and Harold Shipman, the doctor who killed more than 200 patients across Greater Manchester in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Jenkinson's friend, Eddie Ratcliffe, shared her fixation with murder and cruelty. He became her partner in a sickening crime in which Brianna was stabbed 28 times in the head, neck, chest, and back. Both teenagers have now been jailed for life for murder. Jenkinson to serve at least 22 years and Ratcliffe at least 20 years. Born a boy, Brianna was living as a girl at the time of her brutal murder. She lived in Birchwood near Warrington and studied at Birchwood High School. It was here that she met one of her killers just months before her death. Brianna was a strong character but also vulnerable. On the one hand, she suffered from anxiety and an eating disorder but she also ran a hugely popular TikTok account with more than 30,000 followers where she tried on outfits and lip sync to her favourite songs. Brianna spent a lot of time at home. The day she was murdered, her mum had said how proud she was of her for summoning up the courage to take the bus alone to meet a friend. But that journey to Colchester on the number 28 bus would be her last. It was a trap laid by Jenkinson, who, after weeks of fantasising about murder with Ratcliffe, had decided that Brianna was the ideal victim. Jenkinson met Brianna after she started at Birchwood High School in October 2022. She had been excluded from her previous school following an incident in which another child was passed drugs. She and Brianna became friends and they would hang out at the shops or McDonald's after school had finished. Jenkinson had a boyfriend and spent a lot of time in her bedroom playing video games online with Eddie Ratcliffe. Jenkinson lived in Colchester with her parents and siblings. Colchester is a sort of a sleepy commuter town on the outskirts of Greater Manchester. It's got a village green surrounded by shops and, and it's quite a, an idyllic place really. The family was quite well known. They were, they were held in high regard by their neighbours who described them as a perfect, normal family. So neighbours talked about how they'd watched Jenkinson grow up with her siblings and they'd seen her playing out on the street with them. But as she grew up and started high school, they noticed that she'd become a bit of a loner. Still, they said there was nothing that really made her stand out. When I visited the area and spoke to neighbours, one woman said that she'd seen Jenkinson um, with Brianna and Ratcliffe on the day she was murdered. So they said, she said they looked like normal teenagers and there was nothing out of the ordinary about them. Like many in culture, she was stunned when she later learned the awful truth about what had happened. The family's home is less than a mile from the spot where Brianna was killed in Culture Linear Park, and many neighbours said they still won't go to that area because they're so shocked and, and devastated by, by what happened last year. No one knows exactly when Jenkinson's grim obsession with murder and torture began. Her favourite film growing up was Sweeney Todd, the fictional 19th century barber who murdered his victims with razors. 
but it seems that was just the start. During the trial, it was revealed by her psychiatrist that two years prior to the murder, Jenkinson had immersed herself in a world of violence, murder, and materials about serial killers after watching documentaries and searching on the dark web. There, she was able to fuel her deepest, sickest desires, watching real people being killed with unspeakable cruelty. Ratcliffe shared that passion, and the pair spoke about killing up to six children in a series of chilling messages. Eddie was another teenager who spent long periods of time in his bedroom. He was described as a bright academic student who had hopes of going on to university and becoming a microbiologist. He and Scarlett had been friends since they were 11 years old, but back then, no one could have imagined the terrible crime that they would commit together. To Eddie's neighbours, he was just an average teenage boy. Many of them recalled watching him grow up and seeing him going trick-or-treating with his parents and siblings. They said he was always polite, but as he grew older, they would see him less, and he also became something of a loner. Jenkinson also claimed to have already killed two people. It was December 15, 2022, when Brianna first came up in their conversations. Jenkinson told Ratcliffe she was obsessed. But by the new year, that obsession had turned dark. And Jenkinson told Ratcliffe that she had tried to give Brianna an overdose to kill her, but it hadn't worked. Around this time, Brianna had been found by her mother being violently sick and in severe pain. Messages suggested Jenkinson had been frustrated with her failed attempt. And Ratcliffe was more than happy to suggest alternatives to get the job done. Fast forward to the end of January and their plans became more detailed. The investigation revealed that they had plotted to kill another boy before Brianna. Jenkinson set up a fake Instagram account to lure him out, but he blocked it. It was then their attention turned back to Brianna. Jenkinson asked Brianna to meet her in Colchester on Saturday, January 28th. They planned to use Ratcliffe's knife, which she bought on a family holiday over Christmas, but the plan fell apart when Brianna cancelled at the last minute. Panic continued, and Jenkinson even spelled out her plan in a handwritten note later recovered by police. In grim, grisly detail, it spelled out almost exactly what would happen on Saturday, February 11th. The day of the murder, Brianna left her home in Bertrand at around 12.45 p.m. She walked to the bus stop and boarded the number 28 service at around 15 minutes later. She was clearly anxious about travelling alone and even texted her mum to say that she was on the bus and scared. The fact that she'd gone to meet her friend was a big deal for Brianna and her mum replied that it was good that she was out. She later texted to say how proud she was but she doesn't think Brianna ever got the chance to see the message. Jenkinson and Ratcliffe met up before Brianna arrived. Their initial movements seemed fairly normal for a pair of 15 year olds. They went to Sainsbury's to buy some lunch and played with their phones. CCTV footage showed them meeting Brianna just before 2pm and headed towards Culture Linear Park. Despite it being cold that day, the park was full of dog walkers and families. Jenkinson had previously told Brianna that they would be taking drugs and pretending to exchange messages with a dealer. In reality though, there was no dealer. She was sending messages to herself. It was all part of the manipulative plot to get Brianna into the park. Brianna was a clever girl. She realised something was off. In messages to another friend, she described Jenkinson as being weird and that she thought she was making the dealer up. The trio eventually reached a secluded area of the park. It was here, just after 3pm, that her killer struck. Arming themselves with the blade that Ratcliffe had brought on holiday, Brandon was stabbed again and again and again in a merciless and frenzied attack. Her body was discovered at 3.13pm by a dog walker and just two minutes later, Ratcliffe and Jenkinson were seen on dashcam leaving the park. Brianna was pronounced dead just after 4pm and an investigation was launched immediately. At this point, both Jenkinson and Ratcliffe were making their way to their homes. Jenkinson had even come up with a cover story, claiming that Brianna had ditched them and left with a man from Manchester before posting a tribute on Snapchat to Brianna. The investigation was fast paced and 24 hours later, both suspects were in custody. They were in the frame from the earlier stage as Brianna had told her mum who she was meeting that afternoon. Jenkinson was traced through school records and CCTV led them to Ratcliffe. The drinks they'd bought with their lunch was found at the scene and their DNA was on them. On the evening of February 12th, Jenkinson and Ratcliffe were arrested at their homes simultaneously. She questioned why she was a suspect while he told police, I can explain. Scarlett, this is what I've got to say. Yeah. At this moment, because the information I have received 
You are under arrest on suspicion of murder. Obviously, you are under caution, so anything you say is getting recorded. Okay. I found me being suspect is because like, I was the last person I've seen and I'm like, how come I'm a suspect? Pardon? Like, how come I'm a suspect? How come you're a suspect? Because I'm the last person I've seen or is it? I don't know, all, all the information I've received is you are a, a suspect, okay, for the murder. Yeah. You Eddie? Yeah. Eddie, you're locked up suspicion of murder, alright? You don't have to say anything, but you may harm your friends, you don't mention when questioned, so you later line in court, and if you do say we have evidence, do you understand? Yeah. yeah. I can't explain it. No, listen. Right, listen. Do it all on interview, alright? You're going to take it to the corner, you'll be interviewed about it, they'll ask you questions, alright? The trial started at Manchester Crown Court around nine months after the killing and it ended just before Christmas on December the 20th. Covering the case as a reporter was an intense experience. There was a lot of evidence coming thick and fast and a lot of it included dreadful details about Brianna Jai's last moments. Scarlett Jenkinson and Eddie Ratcliffe blamed each other for the killing. Scarlett Jenkinson said the messages in which she was discussing how she wanted to kill other children were just a fantasy. While Eddie Ratcliffe said he was just going along with what Scarlett Jenkinson was saying and he wanted her to try and help him woo a girl that he liked. Eddie Ratcliffe had never met Brianna before, but he used transphobic words in messages he shared with Scarlett Jenkinson. There are some features in the trial which are quite unique for the British criminal justice system. The defendants were allowed to appear on court via video link for some days, which is quite unusual given the seriousness of the case. And Eddie Ratcliffe, who had been diagnosed with autism and had issues with his communication, was allowed to give his evidence by typing on a keyboard rather than speaking in the normal way. The atmosphere in court was quite tense. Court 2 in Manchester Crown Court, where the trial was heard, is quite a compact room. There's lots of families of different people involved in the case. Obviously, Brianna's family, with her mother and father who attended court throughout, as well as the families of the defendants were all there. This was the case that really stood out amongst the other cases that I've regularly heard in this courtroom. It was the lengths that the two killers went to in their plot to try and kill Brianna that was truly shocking. Brianna was larger than life. She was funny, witty and fearless. We miss Brianna so much and our house feels empty without her laughter. To know how scared my usually fearless child must have been when she was alone in that park with someone that she called her friend will haunt me forever. Prior to the trial, I had moments where I felt sorry for the defendants because they had ruined their own lives as well as ours. But now knowing the true nature and seeing neither display an ounce of remorse for what they have done to Brianna, I have lost all sympathy that I may have previously had for them. And I am glad that they will spend many years in prison and away from society. Neighbours of both Jenkinson and Ratcliffe said they felt a degree of sympathy for both families over the impact their children's wicked actions had had on them also. One of Ratcliffe's neighbours said she had sent his family a Christmas card back in December and that she felt a lot of sympathy for them. It is only since they were sentenced that we have been able to publish the names Scarlett Jenkinson and Eddie Ratcliffe. Ever since the crime occurred, when they appeared in court a few days later, a reporting restriction order which was imposed by a judge has made it a criminal offence for the media to reveal their names. This is very standard procedure across the criminal courts. Defendants under the age of 18 are often given anonymity. It's believed that defendants under the age of 18 need to have their welfare protected before they turn into adults. Reporting restrictions can be lifted if after a conviction has been recorded they believe it is in the public interest for that to be lifted and for allow, allowing of the names to be reported. In the end the judge agreed with the media that Jenkinson and Ratcliffe's names should be released to allow full reporting of the case. She agreed that it was in the public interest for this to happen. After they were found guilty of murder Scarlett Jenkinson and Eddie Ratcliffe were both given the youth equivalent of a life sentence. Scarlett Jenkinson was told she has to serve 
a minimum of 22 years, and Eddie Radcliffe, a minimum of 20 years. For the most serious cases where adults are convicted of murder, you do see cases where they are given minimum terms of more than 30 years and maybe even 40 years. But for someone so young, this is a very long sentence for such a serious crime.